verse 26 down to verse 37 will be our text for the day. Luke chapter number 1, verse 26. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God into a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin and spouse of man whose name was Joseph, the house of David, the, and the virgin name was Mary. And the angel came in and said unto her, Hail, thou art highly favored. The Lord is with thee, blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled in her spirit and cast in her mind what manner of salutation should this be. And the angels said unto him, Mary, and said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy mother's womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus, and he shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of the father David. And he shall reign over the land, over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Mm. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be? I want you to put a point pin there because that's something that we will unravel within our message this morning. How shall this be? See, I have not a man. Here's the inversion of the immaculate conception in this time. He said, how shall the, how can this be? And the angel answered and said unto him, the Holy Ghost. Oh, bless God. Thank God for the Holy Ghost. Shall come upon thee, and the power of the house shall overshadow thee, and therefore also the holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thou cousin Elizabeth shall also conceive a son in her old age, and this is the six months with her, who was called barren. But I text, for with God. For with God. For with God. Somebody said nothing. Nothing. That's a compound word. No thing. No thing. Nothing. It says nothing, nothing shall be impossible. Nothing. nothing. I want to preach this word to you today. Here, all things, all things are possible. Amen. Repeat that. Say all things. All things are possible. All things. Now, Father, in Jesus' name, we pray that you rebuke the distraction that come to distract us. Give us a word that may energize us, a word that may cause us to live life in the possibilities. Thank you for these who have come today with their hearts open and receptive as I pray that no distraction come. Allowing us to hear the word, for he that has an ear, let him, her, hear what the Spirit says to the church. For God, you are yet speaking, because you have spoken. Bless us today, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated. It is, a, it is wonderful. I am deeply blessed to have this opportunity to impart to you on the first day of Advent. This season of Advent is primarily for the purpose of us waiting for the anticipated arrival of the greatest gift that God gave to humanity. It was a gift that God gave. The prophets of old, they were prophesizing, foretelling, and foretelling of this extraordinary event that would occur in Bethlehem. They would not live to see it, but they had a glance in it. They had hope for the anticipated arrival of the Messiah, the Mashiach, the one called the Christ. He was to come because his coming was to reconcile man back to God. In John chapter number 3, verse 16, it is a verse that has been, 
has been cited for the endless time, for the ages, and all of us have been able to rehearse and memorize this verse. But few people understand the significance of the verse. The verse said, for God so loved the world. As a result of everything, as a result of everything, God so loved the world that he gave. You ought to stick a pen in there, the word he gave. God gave a gift. It was an undeserving gift. It was a gift that was not merit. We did not deserve it. We did not earn it. But God gave. He gave a gift. A gift that we would not rewrap. Have you ever heard of rewrapping? Yeah. When somebody give you a gift that you don't particularly like or you can't use, you place it on the side. <laughs> until you have an opportunity to rewrap it and give it to somebody. But how many are glad that the gift that God gave, it was not for rewrapping. The gift of God was for the purpose of reconciliation. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that who should believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. It was the gift of God, an undeserved gift. A gift that God gave to us, to us, to you, to me, to end this generation. I am happy for the gift that God gave. He gave to us. I undeserved the gift. It was not a gift for merit or pay. For I could not pay for this gift. It was a gift that God conferred upon me because he loved me. And his love was unconditional. It was not because I did something to receive his love. He just had a plan for my life and he lavished me with his love. How many are happy that God loved us? Amen. He loved us. And that should be our model. That the love that we have for others should not be based upon what they have done for us or the potential of the things that they can do for us. We ought to love people unconditionally. Amen. No matter how they are, no matter what they say, we got to love them. And I will go as far as to say this, that if you find somebody that got the hell in them, you got to love the hell out of them. <laughs> love the hell out of them. Amen. God so loved the world that he gave his only God and son. And so now we have the gift being given to us and unwrapped. But before the gift is given to us, we must rewound and understand the backdrop of what God gave to us and the events leading up to the combination of the gift. And for the next four Sundays, the next three Sundays, this is the first Sunday, the next three Sundays, we will we will visit the journey of the of, of the arrival of the gift. We will visit the journey of the arrival of the gift. I want you to know, and I've said this this morning earlier before I came here, I said this to a group of people before I arrived, that we celebrate the resurrection, and we should celebrate the resurrection, but the greatest holiday in Christendom should always be the holiday of the birth of Jesus Christ. If Jesus Christ was not born, there would not be no resurrection. Although the resurrection culminates the redemption plan that began in the Garden of Eden. I want you to know, God started redemption, start, started the purchasing of us back once we were out of fellowship. He started it not in Jesus. It was culminating in Jesus, but it was started in the Garden of Eden. Listen to the text. The text here in Luke chapter number 1 the first point in the historical backdrop of the text. Luke now, he now interviews eyewitnesses who had a who had a who had a front seat in reviewing the deliberation of the unwrapping of this gift. He now he now gives us he gives us his side of the story. Although the rest of the disciples give a first hand side of the story. Luke now recalls the story, and his, his record of the story is different than the other gospel synoptic writers. He, he, he now interviews people who was close up to this event. 
And this is what he says, that Mary was handpicked by God. Mary was the choice of God. I want you to catch that. She was the choice of God for God to channel this gift to us. What is interesting about Mary is her own background, her own biography. What's interesting that Mary was a peasant. She was a peasant. She did not come from a lineage of royalty. In fact, her socioeconomic status was that she was poor and she lived in poverty all her life. But she was the choice of God. Didn't have much, didn't come from a socioeconomic family, a prominent family, but she was the choice of God. There are sometimes I feel like I am in a disadvantage, particularly when I'm attempting to help our community and I know we don't have such a large visual voice in terms of congregation. I, I don't know sometimes the right people. I think I don't know the right people, but I learned something in my short years of life. I learned if you know the Lord, He's the right, come on, help me somebody. He's the right person to know. Listen to this. The angel now identified her and said, no matter where you are, Mary, you are highly favored. Listen to, listen to the announcement. And he pronounced this blessing that was given to him. An angelic being says, you are highly favored. He said, you are highly favored among all, somebody say all, all, all women. You are, God chose you. He could have chose somebody else, but you're the choice of God. I keep talking about that because I want everybody to understand you are the choice of God. That God chose you. You don't have to feel depressed. You don't have to feel rejected. You don't have to feel like you are lower than Lord. You are the choice of God. He chose you because he has a plan for your life. Somebody asked the question, why am I the choice of God? He has a plan for your life. And if you submit to him, you will fulfill the plan right on time. Because I am convinced that every delay is not a denial. Yeah, yeah. You, you have charted out your life and you have a timeline for your life. But if you feel the pushback, if you feel the delay, it does not mean it's a denial. God chooses the time people. God chooses the people. God chooses the person. Salutation, verse 29, 
it troubled me. And she, she, was, she was troubled and said and cast in her mind, what a matter, what a matter of salutation is this, that I have been chosen by God, that I am the choice of God. I'm poor, I'm unlikely. I should not have been chosen. You know, there are a lot of people, and I want you to hear this, that have an unhealthy view of themselves. You think you're larger than life. And God has a way of crossing this hand. And God, see, God does not work like we work. Uh, we, we work in a systematic order. But how do we know that God can interrupt the order? In fact, he does. He says the flesh shall be made. And the last shall be Some 
I mean, pressing details that he should have included. But anybody that know anything about reporting, that you got to keep your article concise and right to the point. So he gives the major point, first of all, you're highly favored. And then the second point he gives, you have found favor with God. But he does not give an explanation of how she found favor with God. And while I was studying this text, this thing was bothering me that God says you're highly favored and that you found favor. But God, I want to know. I want to know. I need to know. I need to know. Because I, I want to qualify to be in the position where she was. Anybody want to know? And the Lord said to me, the reason why she found, I found favor with her, because I took Noah. You want to get that? He said, I took Noah. I was watching her. I told you she was a peasant. I told you she didn't come from royalty. Her lineage was not a but God said, I still took no. She was lower than lower. Had very little resources. But I took note. What did you take note of? I took note that she did not grumble about where she was. She always had a praise on her lips. The problem with most of us, we grumble at when we have lack. We grumble when things don't go our way. But God said, if you want me to take more, you got to give me thanks in heaven. <laughs> in the good, come on, come on, y'all got to heaven. In the bad, you got to thank me. When you're disappointed, when you're disappointed, thank me. When you have setback, when you have delays, when you're living, to live in the supernatural abundance, but before you get to the supernatural excess, you're going to have some lack days. You will have seven years of plenty and seven years of famine. And when the famine comes, you got to have the same attitude you had when you was living in more than enough. You got to tell God, thank you. God, I help it. You got to tell God, thank you. And right now, in the friendship test, Oh, 
voice of God. She still could not comprehend that she was favor of God because her lifestyle became a part of her. She was a praiser in the condition that she found herself in. I need y'all to get this. She put herself in. It was raining outside, she prays. The cloud hung over her head, and her own, she prays. She didn't have enough money, didn't have enough money, didn't have the right resources, but she prayed. She was engaged to be married, but she prayed. Because he said something, he said, he said the Holy Ghost will overshadow her. He said, this baby you about to have is not going to come bottom side up, but top side down. Which simply means that the Holy Spirit will overshadow you. See, the Holy Spirit prior to, the, to, the, to, to Pentecost was, came for a specific reason. When the Holy Ghost showed up, it had an assignment. Thank God for Pentecost that the Holy Ghost made its permanent entry into our lives. So we have access to the Holy Spirit now. Back then, they didn't have access. So she did not understand the workings and the movement of the Holy Ghost. So that's why she was all messed up when he said the Holy Ghost will come upon me and overshadowed it because she never experienced the Holy Ghost. Some of you sit here like you nonchalant, acting like uh, spectators when you have access to the Holy Ghost. It ought to move on you right now. You can tap in to the Holy Ghost. I know you danced last week, but you ought to have a dance for this week. It's the Holy Ghost that lives. It's the Holy Ghost that renews. It's the Holy Ghost that reconciles. It's the Holy Ghost that will find the joy. It's the Holy Ghost that gives you perseverance. The Holy Ghost teach you how to long suffer. If you don't have the Holy Ghost, you have a disadvantage. She didn't have it and she didn't understand it. But God, but God, through the angel, said to her, with man, it is impossible. But look at somebody and tell them, Church. 